Oh, wonderful. Well, welcome to Pretty Gate Baptist Church. It's great to see you this morning. If it's your first time with us, uh, I do hope you feel particularly uh, welcome. Do stay for teas and coffees and chat uh, after. But we've come here this morning to worship uh, the one true God, the one who, who made everything and he made us and he made a way for us to be friends with him through his son, the Lord Jesus. And it's good to start Sunday by talking to our souls, talking to ourselves and reminding ourselves of who God is and what he has done. So listen to the psalmist. He says this, he's talking to himself and he says, praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all God's benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Well, we're going to take those words and turn them to song as we stand and sing our first song, 10,000 Reasons. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. So let's stand as the music starts and praise God together in song.
Father, we praise you that you are the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love. Father, thank you that you don't treat us as our sins deserve, but as far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our transgressions from us. Thank you that we have all the reasons in the world to praise you this morning. So stir our hearts to turn them back to you, the one true God who made us and has saved us in your son, the Lord Jesus. And may these words be more true of us this morning. May we want to praise you from the bottom of our hearts for all that you are and all that you have done. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please do take a seat. Well, it's great to see you uh, this morning for our morning service to worship and praise God together. And today is a special day because we get to do this twice. So you can come back uh, this evening. Uh, we'll be having a joint service uh, with some other churches uh, in Colchester, Abbeyfield uh, and Greenstead uh, Evangelical Church. Well, they'll be coming to us uh, and we'll be thinking about gospel partnership in Philippians 1 and what it means uh, to be churches in partnership together centered around the Lord Jesus Christ and his gospel. So join us at 6 p.m. Uh, tonight. Uh, we'll be praying for the churches. We'll be hearing God's word. Uh, we'll be singing songs of praise and we'll be hearing from God's word as well. Very similar to this morning, uh, but more with different people from different churches, and it's a great visible display of our oneness uh, in Christ. They do come at 6 p.m. Uh, tonight. Uh, later in the service, uh, you'll be uh, receiving uh, a bookmark. Uh, we mentioned it a few weeks ago that we're going to be starting uh, in Acts. We've already started in Acts. We're going to be starting in February, uh, reading through Acts together as a church. So maybe you had that desire at the start of January, say, I'm going to start, you know, reading my Bible more regularly. Uh, and before you know it, February's come round uh, and the time's flying and you need another kick. Well, here's a kick. And um, we can do it together as a church. Uh, there's 29 days in February and 28 chapters in Acts. So you get a day off uh, as well. Uh, so do grab a, I think Peter and Alan will be distributing them later, the bookmarks. Uh, and on the back of the bookmark, there's some just uh, a little Bible verse to read uh, before you open your Bible and a couple of questions to ask uh, as you read through a text. Because maybe you think, well, what do I even do? I, I don't even know where to start. I read it. What do I do? Well, a couple of questions to help you think through uh, the Bible text as you read it. So let's read the Bible together as a church. Let's talk about it. Uh, and when we open a Bible, we're hearing God speak. And when God speaks, God works. So let, grab a bookmark and get reading uh, Acts. Look forward to that. We've got a few days to prepare, haven't we? What day we say? 28th. So you've got a bit of time to get ready for that. And on Tuesday this week, uh, the 30th of January, uh, we'll be starting our meaningful membership course. I hope you're looking forward to that. This is a course for members, non-members, or people who have no idea what we're even talking about. This is for everyone. It's to take a look at what the Bible says about what the church is, what membership is, and, and what does it mean to, to be part of a church, to be committed uh, to a local uh, church. Uh, it will be a little bit from the front, um, you know, Peter and myself talking. Uh, there'll be lots of time for discussion around table, looking at the Bible uh, together. Uh, and then there'll be opportunity for questions uh, as well. So come along Tuesday night, 7.30. It's a three uh, week course. So all of our midweek uh, program is on hold uh, for the next three weeks, just to really encourage people to come along to this meaningful membership course. So see you there. If you've got any questions about that, talk to Justin, myself, or Peter. We'll be happy to talk more about what will be uh, involved. So see you there. I'm going to hand over to Peter now for a interview or non-interview with Sarah Clay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, we were hoping today to have had a connection with Sarah Clay in Peru. It's been really intermittent. Uh, we have good internet here over there in Peru. It's really up and down. And this morning, her internet, sadly, in Juarez was all over the place. And we didn't want to really take the risk of trying to do this connection on that day. So uh, please do remember Sarah in your prayers. Um, just 
just a little bit about, I've been speaking to Sarah quite a bit this week. She's uh, in the middle of, of discipleship work, working with women and talking to them about Jesus, helping them to grow in their faith. Um, but this, it, this is one of the challenges. Somebody was saying this morning, isn't it amazing that we can talk to people on the internet and the other side of the world? Well, we can, but sometimes it doesn't work. <laughs> and so we're, we're going to have another go at doing this next week. But it makes sense for us just to take a moment to pray for Sarah, doesn't it? Um, uh, she was going to, she's got lots of things prepared to share with us, but we'll do it again in, soon um, uh, uh, on another occasion. Let's pray for her right now, and I'm going to hand back over to, to Matt. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for Sarah. We thank you for the work that she's doing in Juarez in Peru, in South America. Father, we know that it's many thousands of miles away and we thank you for the technology that allows us to be even be able to talk to Sarah and to see her but Lord today we trust you it's not work the way we were planning but we trust that you will give us that opportunity in the weeks that lie ahead and Lord we pray for Sarah who will be quite disappointed at this not working today and we pray that you'd encourage her today as she meets with her church in Juarez as she encourages the women that she's working with, Lord, we pray that both uh, that the, the women would be encouraged, where they would grow in their faith. For those who don't yet know you, we pray that they would come to know and love the Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you for all that Sarah is able to do and continues to do. Thank you for the support and thank you that um, in uh, Easter time she'll be returning back uh, to the UK and we pray that you would meet all of Sarah's needs as she does that uh, to continue uh, uh, raising support for the work. Father we thank you. Father we just take a moment to pray for our Sunday school now. Lord we thank you for our children. We thank you for our young people. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that our children might really grow in their faith. We thank you for each one of them, so precious to you. We thank you, Lord, that you love those children. And may each one understand the gospel, understand what you have done for them, Lord Jesus. We pray for their teachers and those who come alongside them to help them to understand the Bible, to understand your message. And we pray that today, that, that it would be a joyful time as those children uh, uh, learn together along with their teachers. We pray you'd bless them as they go through to their class. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, children, this is the point. Actually, we are going to have you in with Sarah, but she's not going to be here today. So if you'd like to go through to your classes, go through the door that way with Marilyn, and then we'll, go, we'll follow our way through. So... That'd be really good. Not, no discoverers today. You'll be in here with us. But children, have a wonderful time together. Well, before we come to a time uh, of, of prayer, we're going to sing uh, our next song, a, a song which reminds us of the confidence that we have to even come and, and talk to God, the God who made us. We can boldly approach God's throne of grace because of what Jesus has done for us. So let, as the music sta starts, let us stand and sing boldly, I approach the throne.
Please do take your seats. Uh, I'm going to invite uh, Kunle uh, to the front to lead us uh, in a time of prayer now. Thank you, brother. Just for uh, let us pray. As the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, 15 to 16, he said, for we have not an eye priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace 
that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Heavenly Father, King of glory, we want to thank you, Lord, this morning that we can come boldly onto your throne of grace and receive help and receive mercy from you. Father, we know that we are not perfect, but we know that with you, you will help us. As we come, O oh God, to you today, Lord, O oh God, some have brought in one problem or the other. But Lord Almighty, you are the one that visits us. You are the one that helps us, even in all our troubles. Lord, O oh God, I pray even for your visitation this morning. I pray, Father, that Lord, O oh God, you will strength, strengthen the feeble mind. I pray, O oh Father, that Lord, O oh God, you will help, O oh God, even those that are grieving among us even this morning. Lord, those that are weak and those who, who are struggling even in their health. Lord, O oh God, I pray, Father, that Lord, O oh God, let your healing hands, O oh God, rest upon them. Let your blood, O oh God, speak for them this morning in the name of Jesus. Father, we know that we are not sufficient on our own. Our sufficiency is of thee. And that's why we have come unto you to seek for help. And I know that, Lord, O oh God, you will help us this morning as we humbly present ourselves before you on the, in the, on the throne of grace and of mercy. Father, we want to thank you, Lord, O oh God, because you rule and reign in the affairs of men. You rule in our world today, our world of confusion and chaos. But Lord, O oh God, you are the Lord, because the earth belong unto you and the fullness thereof. I pray, Father, that Lord, O oh God, you will intervene in our fears. And that Lord, O oh God, and bring peace, O oh God, even into our world today. Because we have trouble all over the world. People are struggling. There are fights all over the world. All the wars that are taking place, we are overwhelmed. But Lord, oh God, we know that even our leaders cannot help in situation. They cannot come together even to, to, to decide on what you do. But Lord, oh God, you know best. I pray, Father, let your peace reign in our world today. Lord, oh God, speak to our leaders. Give them, oh God, the, 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 the direction that they need. And the Lord, oh God, let them bring peace even to our world. Lord, oh God, we want to thank you, Lord, even for uh, the leadership in this church. Thank you, Lord, oh God, for your grace that is made available. Thank you, Lord, oh God, even for the way, oh God, that Lord, oh God, you have been helping them even to lead us aright. Lord, oh God, I pray for more grace. I pray for more strength. I pray even for your wisdom, your knowledge and understanding of your word. Lord, as they deliver your word, Lord, oh God, I pray that, Lord, oh God, it might bring peace even into our heart. Lord, oh God, it might strengthen even the feeble mind. And the Lord, oh God, it might be, be health even to our soul in the name of Jesus. Father, thank you, Lord, oh God, even for various uh, denominations all over the world and various groups, the Grace Baptist Mission, the Blisswood, the Daylight Trust, and the Latin Link. Thank you, Lord, oh God, for the great work of salvation that you are using even these leaders to do. Even as they preach your word in and out of season, I pray that, Lord, oh God, you bring a new revelation, the revelation of your word, oh God, that they will preach your word with such confidence and the Lord will go with clarity of purpose in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Lord, oh God, we pray even for our young and the children, oh Lord, that have been taught even in this church. Lord, oh God, I pray that Lord, oh God, they may receive the undivided word of truth, that Lord, oh God, they may be able to grow thereby, that Lord, oh God, their faith in you shall continue to grow. And the Lord, oh God, you will help the teachers, oh God, even to teach them aright and to give them the right direction. Lord, oh God, I thank you. Thank you, Lord, oh God, even for Sarah, our missionary in, the, in Huras, in Peru. Thank you, Lord, oh God, for your daughter that you have, been great, you have been using greatly in this foreign land. I thank you, Lord, even for your guidance, for your protection over her, especially as, as she journeys through various regions in Peru. 
to minister your word. I thank you, Lord, even for our work of discipleship to sharing your words of God, especially amongst women in the local church. Lord, we pray for the annual Bible Academy that is due to launch today. I pray, Father, Lord, for the presence of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we've got to fill them, O oh God, with your knowledge of your word. And the Holy Spirit, O oh God, to guide them, to direct them, and to instruct them in righteousness. I pray that they may have a great yearning for God's words and depend and uh, depend on you, O oh God. Lord, O oh God, even for, for growth and for their development, even in your word. Thank you, Father. Lord, O oh God, I also thank you, Lord, O oh God, even for the work that your daughter does with the Rainbow Association and the Latin link. May you continue to fill her with your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. May Sarah continue to receive your grace, strength, as she does your will. I pray that Lord, oh God, you will continue to guide her, you continue to support her, you continue to strengthen her, oh Lord, in the name of Jesus. I pray, oh God, also, the Lord, oh God, even for the, uh, for the Latin link uh, annual conference that is coming up even this month, as well as the Rainbow Association AGM coming on Saturday, 10th of February. I pray, Father, that Lord, oh God, let your Holy Spirit be there with them to direct them, oh God, in their various activities in the name of Jesus. Lastly, I thank you, Lord, even for various support that you have been given to your daughter, physical, spiritual, and the material financial support. Thank you, Lord, oh God, I pray that our ministry shall continue to grow and that Lord, oh God, she shall continue to receive support, oh God, even from those, oh God, that have been supporting her in the name of Jesus. Let the door be open unto her and Lord, grant her the grace Lord, oh God, to continue in your vineyard. Father, we thank you. We bless your name, oh God. As we continue in your worship, let your Holy Spirit, oh God, minister to our hearts and let us sing with joy in our heart and let us receive your word even in our heart, oh God. Lord, oh God, to strengthen us and to bless us, oh God, this day in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Blessed be your name, oh God. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kinley. What a wonderful news of the Bible is that Jesus says these wonderful words that no one can snatch us out of his hands. We're that safe and secure with Jesus. And we're going to sing praise to Jesus now. He will hold me fast and his mercy is more praising Jesus for what he has done for us. And then after that, I will hear uh, from God's word and then Peter will be speaking to us. So let us stand as the music starts and sing praise to God.
justice has been satisfied, He will hold me fast, raised with Him to endless life. He will hold me fast till our faith is turned to sight. When He comes at last, He will hold. Take a seat. We're going to turn to our Bible reading now, and uh, Fumni is going to be reading for us uh, Acts chapter 19, uh, reading from verse 1 to 22. Thanks, Fumni. Good morning. Acts chapter 19, verses 1 to 22. Paul in Ephesus. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. 
but some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to those who were ill and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who are demon possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear and the name of the Lord was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came openly, confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. After this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. After I, have, after I have been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus to Macedonia, while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. May the Lord bless the reading of his words in our hearts. And I'm gonna pray, pray for Peter. Father, we thank you, Lord, even for your word that you have given your son today, even to give to us. Lord, I pray that even as he brings his word, Lord, that he will be your mouthpiece in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray that, Lord, we will receive this engrafted word of God in our hearts, O Lord, and Lord, we will use it in our daily lives. It will bring comfort, it will bring correction, it will bring salvation, it will bring grace even to us in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Well, can I um, uh, add my welcome to you? Um, two things. Uh, as we do that. One is that um, we have some sheets that we give out which help to guide through the sermon. If you'd like one of those, please do take them. Also, we're at this point going to give out the bookmarks. So they're going to be brought round to you. Now, I'm going to encourage you at this point, while those are coming round, have a chat to the people next to you, find out what they've been up to this week. Uh, it'll just take a moment to get the bookmarks out. But the bookmarks, there's one for everyone. Okay, so uh, if we run out, We'll print more, uh, but uh, the bookmarks are there. Just while the bookmarks are going out, it's a great privilege to be able to read the Word of God together. We'll be giving you reminders by email and by uh, text message as well, just to remind you what the reading of the day is. So the bookmarks are going to be available to you there as well uh, to help you follow. So don't be discouraged. Set out to read God's Word. 
I think we're... That's great. Oh, have we got one? Uh, are you looking for a sheet, Helen? Yeah. Have we got any more sheets at all, um, Peter? Just one over here with Helen. That's great. Thanks. Great. Well, I think we're just about there now. So let's uh, settle down as we come to this challenging passage. Maybe as you heard it read, you think, what are we going to say about this passage? Um, we're in the book of Acts. We've been working our way through this book for, uh, near, for probably um, um, quite, well, quite a few months, moving on towards a year now. And uh, we're going to be looking at chapter 19, um, verses 1 to 22. So if you have a Bible, um, have it open in front of you um, so you can check out what I'm saying as we look at it together. Now, I wonder if you've heard of Charles Wesley. Have you heard of Charles Wesley? He was the 18th child of Susanna Wesley. He grew up in a pastor's home. He was educated at Oxford. And while he was there, he grew up uh, he, he, at Oxford. He was part of an accountability group to help him and his friends to uh, read the Bible diligently and to pray and to fast and to serve God, as he put it, every day of every, every hour of every day. Yeah, he fasted and he prayed regularly. He read his Bible frequently. And after leaving Oxford, Charles Wesley went into the ministry. Shortly after his ordination, he went to the United States, to Georgia, on a mission uh, to tell people the message of the Bible. And after he returned to England, he continued with his ministry of preaching and teaching and visiting people. And yet, Charles Wesley wasn't converted. He wasn't a Christian. He wasn't a true disciple of Jesus. In fact, it was only after several life-threatening illnesses that Charles Wesley found peace with God. It was a Sunday morning in May the 21st, 1738. It was Charles Wesley's own day of Pentecost. He wrote in his journal, the Spirit of God strove with me with my own and chased away the darkness of my unbelief. I found myself convinced I knew not how nor when. I found myself at peace with God and I rejoiced in the hope of loving Christ. I saw that by faith I stood. I went to bed still sensible of my own weakness and yet confident of Christ's protection. Charles Wesley trusted in and followed Christ. His life was changed, his ministry came alive, and he was a blessing to so many people. He wrote over 6,500 hymns, hymns like, And Can It Be? and Hark the Herald Angels Sing. You see, Charles Wesley was convinced that he was a Christian believer, but he wasn't. Why am I telling you his story? Well, the reason is because in this passage that we heard earlier read to us, we heard about a group of men who, like Charles Wesley, were zealous, who described themselves as disciples, but in reality knew nothing of the life-changing, life-transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Their story, like the story of Charles Wesley, shows that it's possible to think that you are a Christian believer and yet have never to experience true conversion. That's what we're going to think about this morning. What is authentic conversion? What is authentic ministry? What is authentic repentance? Let's think about that first one. What is it to be authentically converted, authentically a Christian? Verses 1 to 7 help us to understand, because here were people who look like they are saved. They look like Christians. And often there are people like that, aren't there? They can live good lives. They can be sincere and religious and they attend and perhaps are deeply involved in a church. Maybe they even go to Bible studies and pray. And outwardly, everything looks well. But inwardly, things are far from well. Because they aren't saved. They aren't trusting in Jesus. Maybe they, they, they're trusting in the fact that they believe in God. 
or that they were brought up in a Christian home or in their own self-righteousness or their church attendance or their service or their generosity to God's work. But none of those things in themselves make a person a genuine Christian believer. The Bible is clear. Salvation is found in Jesus Christ and him alone. Now, maybe as we look at this section of, of, uh, of Acts together, you might be asking yourself that question. Am I truly a Christian? Do you remember when Peter preached to the religious leaders in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 4? What did he say there? He said this, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. That's what John and Charles Wesley, they were two brothers, what they discovered is what these 12 men discover, and it's what we need to hear this morning, friends. Paul's time in Ephesus was one of the most fruitful seasons of his ministry. He's on his third missionary journey, and he's arrived at Ephesus. Ephesus was a large trading city, and it, especially because at that time it had a harbor, and so it had access to all the main shipping routes. But the city was dominated by the worship of, of Artemis, the, the Roman goddess Diana. And this influence of this cult affected every facet of life. Her image was on everything from coins to buildings, festivals and games were held in her honor, and the city was gripped by magic and sorcery in the occult. Well, when Paul arrives in Ephesus, he, we, we read in verse 1 and 2 that he, he meets some disciples. That's what they think of themselves. It seemed that way. But as Paul talks to these disciples, it seems becomes clear that there are huge gaps in their understanding. And in fact, there is no real evidence of the work of Christ in their lives, of a relationship with Christ, or the evidence of the work of the Spirit. So he says to them, question, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And notice their answer, no. We haven't even heard that there's a Holy Spirit. These disciples, they're in a very different place to a policy we learned about last week. In chapter 18, he had some gaps in his understanding of the gospel that Priscilla and Aquila were able to help him with, but he was a Christian believer. What had these disciples experienced? Well, they'd experienced John's baptism, a baptism of repentance, says Paul. John had prepared the way for the arrival of Jesus. He'd urged people, verse 4, to turn from their sins and to believe in the one coming after him. That's Jesus, the promised Messiah and Savior. The fact that these disciples haven't heard or received the spirit about which John spoke about shows that they are not yet Christian believers. Paul teaches what Jesus taught. And what Peter taught in Acts chapter 2 and verses 38 and 39, that you cannot become a Christian or be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. Every true Christian has the Holy Spirit. And when these men respond, we haven't even heard that there's a Holy Spirit. It can't mean that they've never heard about the Holy Spirit because John talked about the Holy Spirit all the time. The Old Testament was full of reference to, to the Holy Spirit. John talk about, talked about the Messiah baptizing people with the Holy Spirit. What they, what they hadn't heard about was that the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon God's people as happened on the day of Pentecost. We might say that they were living in the Old Testament age that ended with John the Baptist. So when Jesus comes, Jesus ushers in a new age, a new age of the Spirit, the indwelling of the Spirit in every Christian believer. And so having heard the message from Paul, these 12 men, what do they do? They put their faith in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and they confess their faith by being baptized into Christ in water. And what happens next? Well, God authenticates that they too are included in Christ. When Paul lays his hands on them, they, like on the, that day of Pentecost, they speak in tongues and they prophesy. Like John Wesley, they experienced a mini Pentecost, or we might put it like this, that Pentecost caught up with them. 
got up on them and pro the promised blessings of the Spirit are poured out upon them. Now, this passage is really important for a number of reasons. But firstly, because it helps us to understand what true conversion really is, what it really means to be a Christian. You know, many people are confused about authentic Christianity, authentic conversion. And we see here four vital elements in a Christian. And first of all, we see that there must be repentance. There must be repentance. Repentance means when we personally recognize our sin and our rebellion against God and decisively turn away from that sin and self-centered living to Jesus Christ. So there must be repentance. Secondly, there must be faith, but not just any faith. People today will say, oh, I've got faith. I've got faith in trees. I've got faith in, in various gods. I've got faith in faith. But no, faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus Christ as my true sin bearer and saviour. To put my faith in Jesus means that I relinquish all my confidence in my own ability to rescue and save myself. Be that my good works or my church going or anything else I might look to to earn my own salvation. I look to Jesus alone. So secondly, faith in Jesus. And then thirdly, the Bible is clear that every true Christian believer receives the gift of the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8 and verse 9 says this, anyone who does not have the Spirit of God does not belong to him. Having the Holy Spirit is one of the essential marks of a Christian believer. And finally, a Christian believer, every Christian believer is commanded to confess their faith in Jesus Christ by being baptized in water, just like these believers here. Sadly, many Christian believers have never been baptized by immersion as believers, perhaps because they've never been taught that. Or, or maybe they've just gone through their lives and it never really quite happened. Maybe that's you. But here we have a baptistry. We can fill it with water and you can be baptized and follow Jesus through the waters of baptism. We'd love you to come and talk to us about that and we'd help you through that process. It's what all the believers in the book of Acts did, what every Christian believer did in the New Testament. But let me ask you this, Do that, does what I've just described describe your experience? Has the Holy Spirit opened your heart to recognize your sin and your rebellion and, and have you turned from it? Are you trusting in Jesus and in Jesus alone in his death and resurrection? Can you say, I know I'm forgiven. I know I'm right with God, not because of what I have done, because of what Jesus has done. Can you say that God has changed you? You know, we're all works in progress, so we've all got a long way to go. I think the older I get as a Christian, the more faults I see in my life. But has God changed you? I can, one thing I can say is I'm not the person I used to be, but I'm not yet the person God is making me to be. Can you say that? If these things are true of you, have you confessed your faith by believer's baptism? This passage not only helps us understand what it means to be a Christian, but it also helps us to understand the work of God, the work of God's spirit in conversion. You know, in some Christian circles, it would be argued that this passage teaches us that becoming a Christian is a two-stage process. First, there's faith in Christ, and then there comes the baptism in the Holy Spirit, or the receiving of the Holy Spirit, accompanied by speaking in tongues. Now, whatever your view, or our view on these things, this passage cannot be described as describing the normal experience of Christian conversion. These men, these disciples in Ephesus, were not Christians at all. They don't yet believe in Jesus. But through Paul's ministry, their eyes are opened and they believe, they're baptized in water and they receive the Holy Spirit. 
It's important to note that the book of Acts is a book that records a period of transition. As the Holy Spirit is poured on the the believers on the day of Pentecost, they speak in tongues or known languages, affirming that they'd received the Holy Spirit. And then in the home of Cornelius, in Acts chapter 10 and verse 46, the the Spirit again is poured out upon those new Christians, indicating that now Gentiles are welcomed into the kingdom as they speak in tongues. And here in Ephesus, The laying on of the apostles' hands, the prophesying, the tongues, are all signs of conversion, unique public affirmations that these groups were now incorporated into Jesus Christ. They were one with him. They too had the Spirit. In fact, there's no real one pattern in the book of Acts for receiving the Spirit. Some become believers, receive the Spirit, and there are no accompanying signs. But what is clear, friends, is that in the New Testament, the normal experience is that every Christian receives the Holy Spirit at conversion. Now, there may be many following experiences of the Spirit, empowering, strengthening, equippings, but every Christian has the Spirit. Let's talk then, secondly, not only about uh, authentic conversion, but let's talk about authentic ministry because we see that here in the book of Acts in chapter 9 and verses 8 through to verse 16. And maybe for some of us, we're we're reading these things and we're going, well, why aren't these things happening today? Why aren't we seeing these incredible miracles happening today? Why aren't they happening in every church service? Why are they not happening in our lives? Luke goes on to describe Paul's spirit-empowered ministry in Ephesus. And although this ministry was not without its challenges and opposition, Paul's three years in Ephesus were were some of the most fruitful aspects, season of of his ministry. Paul goes to the synagogue, that was his pattern. And he preaches there for three months, boldly arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. In other words, he shows how Jesus was the fulfillment of all those promises in the Old Testament. But just as in Corinth, the Jews reject the message, they refuse to believe it, and they publicly malign the way, the way of Jesus. Verse 9. You know, friends, we don't judge the success of ministry by how many followers we have or how warmly the message is received. Paul could have changed his message to make it more acceptable. More, but like him, we continue to preach the good news of Jesus. Jesus, the one true way to life and forgiveness. Preach repentance and trusting in Christ alone. Well, having been rejected by the Jews, Paul moves to a two-year ministry of daily discussions at the lecture lecture hall of Tyrannius. Now, I don't know who Tyrannius was, but his name means tyrant. So I think, so Paul goes there with with a true message of the gospel into the place that had been set up by a tyrant. Maybe it was a school of philosophy, something like that. But what was the result of these discussions? Well, verse 10, all the Jews and the Greeks who lived in the providence of Asia, heard the word of the Lord. During these two years, we read verses 11 to 12, that God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, verse 12, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. What do we make of it? Should we be seeing these things happening today? Perhaps Some of us think, yes, maybe you're not sure. Why are we not seeing some of these things described in the book of Acts? Well, there are some Christians that say we should do. There should be the normal experience of Christian believers. Maybe it's something we can have a conversation about later on. But what is actually happening here is this. I think in verses 11 to 17, Paul is describing a confrontation A confrontation between the power of the living God with a city that is fascinated by magic and the occult. And it's in this setting that Paul is, or Luke rather, is recording these extraordinary miracles. And by now, it shouldn't surprise us that God heals through the Apostle Paul. And nor does it surprise us that God can do that even at a distance. But what surprises us is that he uses these props handkerchiefs, aprons that Paul has touched. It all sounds a bit dodgy, doesn't it, and questionable. 
Luke describes these as extraordinary miracles, not just miracle, extraordinary miracles. They're not, in other words, typical as miracles go. And this isn't magic either. As we'll see, the Ephesians are told to renounce their magic and occult practices, verses 18 and 19. And neither is this an authentication of those American televangelists who say, give us your money and I'll send a handkerchief and it'll heal you. That's not an authentication of that. These special miracles were not confirming superstition. This is God, as it were, accommodating himself to the Ephesians, while at the same time authenticating Paul's ministry among them. We see a similar thing when Jesus condescended to the hesitant face of the woman who touches the edge of his cloak. Do you remember? And she's healed. She, she doesn't want to speak to Jesus. So she's like, well, if only I can just touch the edge of his cloak, I'll be healed. And Jesus condescends to her face and he heals her. God has always limited himself in dramatic, sometimes unexpected ways to communicate to a fallen, imperfect people. Maybe Luke is aware of the danger that some might see the previous accounts as magic. So in verses 13 to 16, he now tells us about an attempt by the seven sons of Sceva, who were non-Christian Jews, to harness the power of God through using the name of Jesus that they'd heard Paul preaching. So what do they do? They come along to the man who's demon-possessed, and they think, well, we'll use the name of Jesus to cast out this demon. And what happens brings them within an inch of their lives as they try to cast this demon from the man. The evil spirit answered them, Jesus, I know, and I know Paul, but who are you? And the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Do you remember when Jesus healed the demon-possessed man? It was the very reverse. The very reverse. Luke is making a crucial point. Contrary to popular belief at the time, and sadly today, the name of Jesus, the words are not some magical words that we can speak over the powers of evil. No, if we're to be channels of his power, it's not because we know about his name. Even the demons know this and tremble. It's because we know him, and more importantly, are known by him. He's not a spiritual power that we can somehow manipulate for our own ends. He's the sovereign Lord who we worship and we serve. You see, the central lesson here is not that we're called to perform similar miracles, though God sometimes does and will do miracles. But here we're being taught that we cannot do ministry without his power. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who makes ministry possible. The disciples were told in Acts chapter, eight, uh, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, what they were told? That you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and out to the ends of the earth. You see, the Holy Spirit is given primarily to empower God's people for witness. As Christian believers, we're called to, to, to live our lives and to do ministry and to witness to Christ, not in our own strength and power. Because if we try to do that, we'll fail. But in the power of the Holy Spirit. The passage raises all sorts of questions, doesn't it? For, for us as individual believers, but for us as a, as a church. If the Holy Spirit were to be withdrawn from us, what would it look like? Would it look different? In whose strength are we seeking to live and to serve? In our own or in the power of the Spirit? Are we really convinced that Jesus' words in John chapter 15, that apart from me, you can do nothing? How we need the work of the Spirit among us. Well, there's the middle section, and now we come to the final section, verses 17 to 20. And we th we're now going to look at this, this uh, in a little bit more detail. What does authentic repentance really mean? What does it mean to repent, to turn away from our sin? Well, despite the attempts of the sons of Sceva to use the name of Jesus for their own glory, Jesus, verse, 20, sorry, verse 17, gets all the glory. 
When this disastrous exorcism becomes known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were filled with fear and the name of Jesus was held in high honor. You see, no power, no, not even Satan himself can hold back the unstoppable gospel. But I want you to notice what this encounter brings about, this powerful encounter with the kingdom of Satan, what it brings about. As the gospel is preached, men and women are gripped by, uh, who are gripped by the power of the occult are converted and delivered and set free. Many of those who believed now come and confess their evil deeds. A number of those who've practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. And when they calculated the number of scrolls, the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. Now, you don't know what a drachma is, do you? But a drachma is a, quite a lot of money. That's like a day's wages, a drachma. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. It's what we saw earlier. The reality and the authenticity of their conversions is made clear as these new believers take radical steps to rid themselves of everything in their lives associated with occult practices that previously had been such a big part of their lives. And that bonfire was no small thing. 50,000 drachmas is about three and a quarter million pounds. Why would you give up so much wealth? Why, would you, why wouldn't you just sell it and get some money for it? Well, these young believers, instead of making a whole bunch of cash selling their scrolls, burn them. And by that act of repentance, they were giving evidence of the genuineness of their conversions. They'd found something, someone so much better, so much more wonderful. They'd found salvation in Jesus Christ. Someone who was worth everything. And what was the result of the witness of their costly decision? The word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. I remember some years ago, quite a lot of years ago, I was a young Christian. I hadn't been a Christian very long. And uh, it was in the days of records. We didn't call them vinyl then. We called them records, you know, with a needle and things. And, um, and, I, and I was a young Christian, a young believer. And... Um, I, the Lord had convicted me about the, the, the godless values of the music that was increasingly filling my life. It was incompatible with my faith in Jesus Christ. My records had become an idol getting in the way of me following Jesus. And I knew that my records had to go, but they were worth quite a lot of money. And I suddenly thought, well, I can't sell them because if they're not right for me, they're not right for anyone. And so one evening, at the side of my house, I got a hammer and I smashed my records into little bits and put them in the bin. It wasn't that it was right for everyone to get rid of their music, but it was right for me. It was in the way of my faith in Jesus Christ. And I said, Lord, you must be first. And so I bin the lot of them. Now, there was nothing special about that. I simply was removing out of my life something that was in the way. Maybe for you, there's something different. Maybe for you... It's pornography. Maybe for you, it's some relationship that's in the way. Maybe for you, there's an idol and it's keeping you from Jesus. Are you prepared to turn away from it? For the Ephesians, it costs them. Jesus calls all of those who come to him to repent, to turn away from our sin, to turn from everything that, that stands in God's place and to believe the gospel. But the Holy Spirit, you see, continues to lead us in a life of repentance. In Matthew 18 and verses 8 to 9, Jesus challenges us as his followers to do whatever it takes to fight against sin. And this is what the Holy Spirit does for the believer. He convicts us of sin. He not only comforts us and conv he convicts us, he, he calls us to confess our sin, even embarrassing sins, and to confess them perhaps to a trusted friend. And at times like the Ephesians, it might mean a willingness to make financial sacrifices to lose friends or even end a relationship. So let's think about repentance. What does it mean to have a repentant heart? Well, 
It means that we name our sin as sin. We don't excuse it. We demonstrate godly sorrow about the sin itself. When we actually confess our sins before we get caught. When we have a willingness and an eagerness to make amends and to put things right, demonstrate that things have changed. When we're willing to confess our sins, even in the face of serious consequences. When we seek comfort in the grace of God in Christ Jesus, not simply for being free from the consequences of our sin. And when we walk in humility and teachableness, that's repentance. See, the Bible makes it clear there is only one authentic saving faith. The Bible is clear that we are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone, not by our own efforts. It's because of God's grace that we are loved and forgiven and saved from our sin, and our sin is completely removed and forgiven. Not because of who we are or what we do, but because of the work of Jesus Christ. And we've seen today that there is only one way that we come to Christ, by repentance, by turning from sin to the Saviour of sinners. But that repentance is to mark our lives as we live. And finally, we talked about authentic ministry and witness. As we seek, as we serve the Lord, let's do so. As we witness, let's do so, not in our own strength, not in our own power, but in the enabling and the strengthening of the Holy Spirit to God's praise and glory. Let's pray, shall we? Loving Father, there is so much in this passage, and Lord, I'm sure that there are questions that have been raised as we've looked at it together, but Lord, thank you that at the heart of this passage is true conversion. What it really means to be a believer in you, what it means to walk in repentance, and to turn from our sins, and what it means to live our lives in the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, would you help us? And as we think through these things, as we allow your Spirit to speak them into our hearts, we pray that we would be willing to respond and to listen to what you're saying. Father, help us. And for those who have never trusted Christ this morning, may today be the day that they reach out and they realize that you've been reaching them Father, we pray that you'd work in us your good work and your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's sing together. We're going to sing a, a, a song of praise as the musicians come to the front. Yet not I, but Christ through me. And this song this, is really all about that fact that it's not what I do, but what Christ does in us, in, in, in you and I that makes us into followers of Jesus. Let's sing together as the music begins. Let's stand. What gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer?
It may be that, as I've been speaking today, maybe you've got questions, questions about whether you are a follower of Christ. Maybe there's areas of your life you're conscious of getting in the way of your relationship with God. Well, if that's you, please come and pray. Talk to myself, to, to Matt, to Justin, to one of the, the a Christian you know and trust here in this place. Don't go away without getting right with God. It's the most important thing in all the world. It's the, the most joyful thing in all the world. Don't leave it. Get it sorted, even today, this week. Come to him. Father, we thank you for our time together. Father, we thank you for what you've been teaching us. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you draw to yourself those that you are calling Cause us to turn to you, each one of us, to know the joy of following Christ, even in the midst of trouble, difficulty, and challenge. And now to him who is immeasurably, able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, do please take your seats. Um, there is tea and coffee served to your left. If you've joined us online, can we say thank you for joining us? May you really be blessed in, in this week ahead. But let's talk together about some of these things as we chat in conversation this, uh, after this service.